Several years ago, I wrote a series of blog posts on things that I would say to like particular kinds of people or how I would respond to particular kinds of people. And I included um, someone who says that they're happy about their abortion or someone who says that they wish that they had been aborted um, or someone who has post-abortive friends. Like, what are some things that I would be thinking about as I thought about how to kind of respond to the things that they would say? And in response to that, a guy named Daniel in Canada reached out to me and said, well, what would you say to someone who does abortions? And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and there had been some discussions uh, around that time on both the Secular Pro-Life blog and Jill Stanek's blog um, on the same topic. And I posed the question on my Facebook page. And, and then I ultimately basically wrote out some of my own thoughts, uh, some of my own kind of tips and like some questions that I might ask. And I combined that with some of the best things that I saw. Um, some of the people following me write. I also was really grateful to have the help of Abby Johnson um, on this piece. He thought it was a really cool idea, and, and she collaborated and has some really good thoughts um, coming from kind of the background that she did on, on what would work really, really well, what might not work so well. So thanks again for Abby for helping with this piece. And before I get into it, I'll just say real quick, there's a really cool kind of postscript to the piece that most people don't know, which is that after I published it, an abortion practitioner from the, the Midwest raced out and said that she would love to have coffee or lunch with me if I'm ever in her area. And so um, this has already potentially brought up a kind of a new opportunity. Certainly she felt like it was a really good piece and she appreciated the tone of it. So again, that was just kind of a cool thing that happened after the piece. And, and I think if you use kind of the tone and some of the thoughts from this, um, you also might be able to have the opportunity to actually um, have a, a real friendship, um, a, a dialogue uh, with people who, who do abortions and very well might see them leave the industry over that. It certainly wouldn't be the first time. So... The piece is called Nine Things I Would Ask an Abortion Practitioner Over Coffee, and the first two paragraphs are introduction that I basically already just said, so then the piece goes on. These opportunities can actually happen. Sidewalk counselors are in an especially good position to develop friendships with abortion practitioners. Abby Johnson's book, Unplanned, recounts the impact that the kind members of Coalition for Life had on Abby. I had the great privilege of coaching my friend Don Bly, the sidewalk counselor in Modesto in Stockton, who was having a congenial email exchange with the abortion practitioner at his local abortion facility. He's also had multiple conversations with other abortion practitioners since. Before I get to the list, I think that the best environment for conversations like this would be at a neutral place, like a coffee shop, as opposed to the sidewalk in front of the abortion facility. This may not always be possible, but if the abortion practitioner was willing to meet once a month for coffee, I would take that opportunity in a heartbeat. No pun intended. To my non-Christian readers, religion is about to happen, but it's important to explain where I'm coming from on this topic. As Paul, commenting at Jill Stanek's blog, points out, sharing a meal with a person that some consider quote-unquote scum would be following in the footsteps of Jesus. This is Matthew 9, verses 11 through 13. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked Jesus' disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Commenter Sidney posted a wonderful Charles Spurgeon quote on why we should be willing to meet with people like this. He said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. End quote. If meeting for coffee wasn't possible, I think an email exchange can be very fruitful if you're especially careful to point out common ground when possible. Remember, in an email exchange, you can't benefit from nonverbal communication, which makes a huge impact when discussing a contentious topic like abortion. Note, according to the Allen Guttmacher Institute, there were approximately 1,720 abortion providers in the U.S. in 2011, a 4% decline from 2008. There are both men and women performing abortions, but for the sake of this article, I'm going to use male pronouns when referring to the hypothetical abortion practitioner I could talk to. I'm not trying to imply anything about men or women performing abortions with this choice. I simply don't want to say him or her every single time I refer to this image bearer who performs abortions for a living. 
If I could meet with an abortion practitioner, I might ask one or more of these questions. Number one, are you married? When I interviewed my friend Abby Johnson for this article, she explained that when she meets an abortion practitioner for the first time, she tries to get to know him and doesn't ask a ton of questions. Spend most of your first meeting listening to him, Abby said. Get to know him. Is he married? What's his family like? Does he have kids? What do they love to do? Ask the kinds of questions you would ask someone at your church that you're getting to know. Abby urged that pro-life people should take a relationship like this slowly. Don't try to convert him in one meeting. Abby said, take it slow. Conversion takes time and trust. Given that good advice, I'm going to offer some more questions you may ask, but these could be spread out over a long series of meetings. Most of these may be more appropriate for after you've gotten to know each other and built some trust. Each person will probably be different. Some of these you may never want to ask the person, and you'll develop the art of learning what not to ask if you spend enough time talking to people who believe differently than you. It may even take making some mistakes to learn what signs to look for. Think of the rest of these questions as tools for your toolbox. Keep something else in mind. Many abortion practitioners fear for their very lives when they see pro-life advocates. Obviously, we shouldn't all be lumped in with the people who have killed abortion practitioners. I don't call these people pro-life. But if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who performs abortions and get in touch with the fear that many of them live with every time they go to work, you may develop an empathy for that part of their lives. Nobody wants to go to work thinking they might be killed or blown up. Many abortion facilities even have bulletproof glass. Given that, I think it would take a lot more courage for an abortion practitioner to meet with you than it takes for you to meet with him. Abby Johnson agreed and said, be thankful that he took this courageous step in the first place. Question number two, tell me how you got involved in the work that you do. This is one of the first questions Abby Johnson asks abortion practitioners. Notice this question is much more conversational than something like, you didn't grow up wanting to kill babies, did you? One question is asked with an open heart, and the other is accusatory, and will probably shut down the conversation before it's really begun. Abby offered another piece of helpful advice. Don't make any assumptions about this person. Don't call him an abortionist, because he might do other things too, Abby said. There are very few full-time abortion doctors in the United States right now. This person might be an OBGYN and deliver babies four days out of the week. I think there's a second reason not to call him an abortionist, which is also a point Matt Casper made on my Facebook wall. Dialogues tend to go better when you call people what they want to be called. In this case, this person would want to be called a doctor. Regardless of whether or not you think pro-lifers should refer to abortionists as doctors among themselves, I wouldn't call this person an abortionist to his face because the potential value of our good conversations is much higher than the supposed value of calling him an abortionist. And then I include an update that I added later. I said, see the note at the bottom of this post for why now I believe that abortion practitioner is a better label than abortionist. Basically what happened was I posed a discussion question on the blog and asked people from both sides of the issue to talk about what we ought to call people um, who do abortions because it seems like if you just say doctor, that's kind of too positive. I don't want to completely destigmatize abortion, um, but abortionist uh, sounds rude and certainly is going to be very off-putting for the people who are doing it and you want to have a good conversation with them. And, and you can read that whole discussion. I'll link to it. Um, um, but in the end, um, I felt that abortion practitioner was the best balance between these two um, kind of difficult ends of the spectrum. Question number three, do you find your work meaningful? And if so, what makes it the most meaningful to you? My friend Jasmine April posted this question on my Facebook page. It's similar to a very common question that pro-lifers recommended asking, what drives you to perform abortions? I like Jasmine's because I suspect it won't come across with the judgmental attitude that this abortion practitioner is certainly expecting to come from a pro-life advocate. Remember, you can have the right heart, but still ask a question that the other person is likely to misunderstand. You may have a genuine curiosity about this person when you ask what drives you to perform abortions, but the abortion practitioner may hear you asking what motivates you to kill babies every day. Everybody wants to find meaning in their work. Unless this person is in this solely for the money, and people's motivations are usually much more complicated than that, this person probably believes that he's doing something good for the world. Perhaps he believes that he's helping protect women from being enslaved by their reproductive systems. Perhaps he believes that he's helping keep abortion access available in his area at a time when the number of abortion practitioners is dwindling. 
you will almost certainly disagree with the premises that lead to this person choosing to perform abortions for a living. But you won't learn where this particular abortion practitioner is coming from until you ask questions like this. Question number four. Do you think pro-life and pro-choice people should work together to provide resources and support to women in crisis? Jasmine April recommends asking this, quote, I assume we both agree that it is incredibly important to help women in crisis. If so, I think we simply differ in the best means to accomplish that. Would we agree that both pro-life and pro-choice people should work together to provide resources and support to women in crisis so that those who do want to keep their children are empowered to do so? End quote. This question has great potential for finding common ground. You both might have a discussion on what would be the most helpful for women in crisis, but you will both learn more about each other's views by engaging in that discussion. The abortion practitioner may get into a rant about dishonest crisis pregnancy centers, but you can just respond that you agree that pregnancy resource centers should never use dishonest tactics. And then I link to a video interview that I recorded a long time ago with a uh, Fresno Pregnancy Care Center director about that subject. I'll link to it in the description. Question number five. Do you believe the unborn is a living human organism? My formerly pro-choice friend Andrew suggested this one. I like how clear it is. If you just ask, do you think the unborn is human, you open the possibility for equivocation. That's when two people are using the same word in a conversation, but they mean different things by that word. You may mean biologically human, while the other person might think you mean valuable person with rights. With this question, it's pretty likely the person you're talking to understands that you're asking a question about the biology of the unborn. Is it biologically alive? Is it biologically a member of the human species? Is it a unique organism separate from the mother? Andrew also recommended this follow-up question about the philosophical side of the debate. What do you think makes life valuable? Why is this question worded so well? It assumes, almost certainly accurately, that the abortion practitioner believes that there are people whose lives have value. When I hear some pro-life advocates talk about abortion practitioners, the implication is that the abortion practitioners not only believe that there are no morally relevant differences between the unborn and the born, but also that they don't think any life has intrinsic value. I think it's much more likely that abortion practitioners agree that born people have value, but they ground that value differently than pro-life people do. Perhaps the abortion practitioner thinks you need to be viable to have basic rights, and he only does abortions on pre-viable children. Perhaps the abortion practitioner thinks you're not morally relevant until you have a fully functioning neocortex. He may even believe that you're not a person until after you're born and are self-aware by some definitions. Those views are still different from having this dark view that no life is valuable and any life can be taken at will. We're trying to understand where the abortion practitioner is coming from, and asking an open-ended question like this may successfully draw out his perspective. Question number seven. What would it take to change your mind about the morality of abortion? Everybody should be able to answer this question. I know that my mind could be changed about abortion legality if I was convinced that bodily rights arguments successfully accomplished what they are designed to accomplish. I would also need to believe that when the Bible talks about caring for the most vulnerable in society, like widows and orphans, it doesn't include caring for the unborn. If the abortion practitioner is a thoughtful person, and some absolutely are, he will already know what it would take to change his mind about abortion. This information will reveal a lot about his thinking on the topic. Jasmine April recommends this alternative. Would you say that, hypothetically, if the unborn are valuable persons like you and I, that abortion would be wrong? If yes, proceed to the equal rights argument. If no, proceed to the way we respond to bodily rights arguments. Question number eight. Are there any situations where you would not perform an abortion? Kim Selden Payton recommended this question in these follow-ups. Would he refuse aborting after 20 weeks gestation for gender selection? And if so, why? I love this question because it's total common ground territory. You might even consider asking this one early in the conversation, especially if the abortion practitioner seems hostile. If he responds, yeah, I wouldn't do an abortion on a girl if I knew the parents were aborting solely because of gender, you can respond, yeah, I disagree with sex selection abortions too. I've talked to lots of purchase people who are also opposed to sex selection abortions, but often for varying reasons. Can you help me understand why you wouldn't perform a sex selection abortion? In question number nine, are you aware that there are resources for abortion doctors who want to change their career path? He may already be aware of Abby Johnson's and then there were none ministry but I would want to make sure of it. I believe there are some people in the abortion industry who are there mainly because they feel trapped. 
they don't think they could get another job, and it's a bad economy. As of the time I'm writing this, Abby's ministry has helped 115 clinic workers leave the industry. And this abortion practitioner you're talking to could be the next if he knows about the resources and has an openness to changing careers. 